In Britain, Iraq is former Prime Minister Tony Blair's war. And in the wake of today's Chilcot inquiry, even he recognized that war came with terrible costs. Follow the threads of sectarian conflict, the rise of ISIS and the refugee crisis, and the world is living with its consequences. Joining me now to discuss them, Saeed Khan, a Middle East historian at Wayne State University, and Stephanie Carvin, assistant professor of international affairs at Carleton University and a former national security analyst with the federal government. Thanks to both of you for coming in tonight and to, to talk about this. I want to hear from both of you on this question, but Saeed, why don't we begin with you? What, what did you find most surprising uh, out of this today? Unfortunately, Paul, there really weren't any surprises. Uh, in fact, the report was a rather disappointing confirmation of what was already suspected and perceived over the last seven years in the, um, the time that it took to compile the report, uh, that the war was discretionary, it was a war of choice, uh, most likely illegal. And uh, we saw with the tone of uh, Prime Minister Blair today that uh, giving his uh, apology or his uh, uh, admission of full responsibility comes from the fact that there is no accountability through the report. There will be no prosecution for war crimes or for any other uh, of the vast uh, number of violations that occurred from this. So what we have in the legacy and in the wake of uh, the, uh, this uh, war is uh, over 250,000 Iraqis dead, several hundred thousand wounded, to say nothing of the trillions of dollars that were expended, as well as, of course, the casualties on the Allied side fighting a war of, uh, of choice. And Stephanie, what about you? Uh to a certain extent, I, I would agree with the fact that there wasn't a lot surprising in it. I think you, I, for me at least, uh, the one surprising thing was just how uh, critical it was. Um, if you had lined up any of the criticisms of the Iraq war that had been made against it uh, in the last uh, 13, 14 years, pretty much every single one of them was, in fact, in this report. Uh, the other surprising thing I would suggest is, was this memo that was released, uh, where Blair basically is telling Bush, uh, I am with you, uh, whatever. And uh, to me, that was a bit surprising, just how, how uh, close that, uh, that relationship was and just how much uh, Tony Blair was, in fact, supporting George W. Bush, perhaps thinking that he could get some leverage uh, in that situation. Here's an understatement. The invasion of Iraq had many complicated consequences. Um, I wonder what you think was the most incriminating. Stephanie? Uh, really, for me, uh, again, two things really stand out. Uh, the first thing is uh, Afghanistan, um, the absolute um, uh, failure uh, and abandonment of Afghan the Afghan mission in order to conduct this other conflict uh, in in Iraq, and we really, you know, did see the uh, the attention of the U.S. and and Britain, who were major contributors to Afghanistan, turn to uh, that that conflict, and as a result, we're still de dealing with uh, the return of the Taliban and in what is certainly an intractable conflict. Uh, the other thing would, of course, be Syria. I don't think you can separate what happened in 2003 from the current Syrian conflict today. And, you know, the fact that the extremist networks that developed in Iraq uh, during the insurgency period have gone on to uh, basically form the Islamic State and, of course, Iraq havoc in Syria and uh, Iraq. Saeed, you're nodding your head there. Yes, I agree with Stephanie. I mean, there's really three consequences of this. First of all, the causal link between the Iraq invasion and ISIS. Uh, no Iraq war, no ISIS. Second of all, we find that there's an escalation and a proliferation of this proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which is uh, now uh, in really its fourth decade. And then third, as Stephanie said, the metastasization of this into now regional conflicts in Syria, in Yemen, uh, where we find that proxy war being prosecuted by uh, really clients of either side. And, uh, of course, uh, the emergence of these uh, militant groups, which have uh, a global reach now, uh, affecting even uh, Western countries. Hey, could you just connect the dots a little bit, Saeed, on the rise of ISIS uh, flowing from the invasion of Iraq? 
Well, it's important to recognize, Paul, that the uh, backbone of ISIS is really uh, the former revolutionary guard of Saddam Hussein. Uh, we're talking about people who were uh, Ba'athists, part of his elite force, part of his military, who after the invasion and the debathification of Iraq uh, are really sent into a, a kind of a maelstrom. Uh, they are disarmed, at least uh, as far as the United States is concerned, uh, and yet at the same time they were privy to where all the weapons caches were. They bided their time in, uh, in Iraq until uh, a, a certain time when the iron was so hot, if you will, through sectarian conflict after Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki had almost declared a kind of sectarian war against the Sunni population. They were then able to leverage that, exploit that narrative into then having a reprisal. So with that, uh, you have ISIS. And as a result of it, now that it has spread, we find that if it wasn't for that original sin, so to speak, of the Iraq invasion, there really wouldn't have been a need or a raison d'etre for ISIS to even exist. Uh, on this, there is no debate that, that man, foreign policy uh, was changed forever. So I want to again hear from both of you on how this has changed how Canada and the U.S deal with conflict. Uh, Canada never fights alone. It's always fighting with allies. So in that sense, you know, it has to look at what, uh, you know, its prospective coalition partners are doing and saying and having to weigh that evidence for itself. And in this case, I believe Canada did make the right choice in not participating in the conflict. But other major implication of all of this is I would say that Iraq um, really is going to be the prism through which we view all subsequent conflicts in, in terms of, particularly in the Middle East, but in terms of humanitarian military operations for the near future. And we're already seeing this, of course, in the discourse uh, surrounding Libya, surrounding uh, Syria, and the reluctance to put troops on the ground in order to uh, even stop uh, civilian, a lot of the civilian uh, damaging or to perhaps uh, play a role in ending the conflict. So this will be a, a prism for at least, I would say, the next generation uh, of scholars working in this area and perhaps uh, the general public as well. And what about for the U.S. side? As we've seen in the Obama administration actions in Libya as well as in Syria, they are on the one hand a, a stuttering uh, and a, 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 a policy which lacks in coherence in Libya and also a high level of reluctance uh, in the case of, uh, of Syria as to whether to put troops on the ground, how to engage with coalition partners and of course now with uh, the Russian involvement, how to then deal uh, on a diplomatic basis with, uh, with a very important country uh, that has a lot of military stake uh, with it. At the same time, of course, we also have the election cycle here in the United States and we have two candidates, both of whom tend to be much more hawkish than the current president. On the one hand, there's a candidate whose uh, foreign policy is, uh, to put it very kindly, incoherent. And at the same time, we have another candidate who seems to be all the more uh, interested uh, at trying a military option. Now, what Iraq has done is set the bar very high. And what I'm afraid of is that either candidate is going to feel as though any kind of military engagement is permissible as long as it doesn't have that level of uh, heavy casualty and cost. So anything is acceptable short of a, uh, essentially a genocide in the case of 250,000 dead, several hundred thousand injured, and a country that is now in disarray. Leaving us with plenty to think about. Super interesting. Uh, Saeed Khan in Detroit, Stephanie Carvin in Ottawa, thanks very much for speaking with us tonight. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.